I'll go ahead and introduce our presenters today and really appreciate you all uh, taking the time to join us and talk about this topic. Uh, we have Liz Townley, who is a Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Rivers Planning Specialist with the Forest Service. Steve Chesterton, who's our National Wild and Scenic Rivers Program Manager with the Forest Service. Peter Molly, our National Wilderness Program Manager for the Forest Service. And Mary Erickson, Forest Supervisor on the Custer Gallatin National Forest. So thanks very much. And Liz, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Nancy. And welcome to What's in a Title. Uh, this is a conversation about designated areas, how they become designated, and how we manage these areas in the interim. And as an agency, we spend a lot of time investing in the skills and expertise it takes to manage a designated river or wilderness area. We train employees in monitoring wilderness character, building trail monitoring outstandingly remarkable values, interacting with the public, cleaning toilets and campsites. But from my perspective, not as much training goes into understanding the planning behind why we do what we do and how we get to these outcomes. Um, I think effective public land management requires good planning and good implementation. And a well-rounded steward of our public lands should ideally possess both of these skill sets, those on the ground resource management skills and knowledge of the planning processes behind them. So today we're gonna focus on the planning side and this will be at that 30,000 foot level because if we went any closer, we'd probably have to spend the whole week talking about this. <laughs> There's a lot of detail and a lot of nuance when it comes to planning. But if any of this sparks a curiosity and an interest for you to learn more, I definitely encourage you to grow the side of your work portfolio. And if you have any questions about this, um, I know at the, end of, at the end of the session today, we'll have time and all of us would be happy to talk about this. Um, and this reminds me, so regarding questions, um, I think Nancy touched on this, but you know, we're gonna ask that you hold questions until the end of the presentation. Um, that said, if you want to put them in the chat in line with the presentation so you don't forget, that's totally fine. Uh, we'll just address them during the Q&A portion. So in case you haven't guessed it, our uh, presentation today has a road trip theme, theme because who um, doesn't love road trips, right? All right, so... Um, we're going to take turns driving today, and I know Nancy just did um, a present or a introduction, but if our presenters could just uh, tell us a little bit more about ourselves as our drivers, that would be great. Um, so Steve, we'll start with you. Nancy mentioned your position, but where are you located? How long have you been doing this kind of work? Um, you know, and maybe you could tell us, you know, what you uh, intended to do with your life in this version of you that's shown on the screen here. What were your life goals? Wow, big questions, Liz. Uh, so yes, uh, so I'm Steve. I'm the Wild and Sink Rivers National Program Manager for the Forest Service, uh, the Washington office, so based in Washington, D.C. I've uh, been with the Forest Service uh, and the, actually the Wilderness and Wild and Scenic River Washington Office staff for a little over 10 years now. I am also um, an agency representative on the Interagency Wild and Scenic River Coordinating Council. Uh, in this uh, senior year photo from high school, um, <laughs> I was, let's see, I was planning to be a psychology major. Uh, and en route to uh, leaving Western New York in the blustery, snowy, gray winters there that I've experienced for the first 18 years of my life and headed to the West Coast, which uh, uh, to go to school in California. So, which uh, opened my eyes to Western landscapes for the first time. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Peter? Thanks, Liz. My name is Peter Molly. I'm the Forest Service's National Wilderness Program Manager. So Steve's counterpart is doppelganger. And I've been in this job for a little more than two years. I work out of the Washington office and live just outside of DC in Maryland. And prior to that, I was doing a similar job for the Bureau of Land Management. I was BLM's National Wilderness Program lead, also in Washington. So I have experience with the wilderness program from two of the four wilderness managing agencies. In terms of what I wanted to do in this 
photo here, which is also from my senior yearbook. Let's see, um, th that pretentious young man uh, probably uh, wanted to be the next uh, David Byrne of Talking Heads. I think I had said when I applied to college that I was interested in majoring in either architecture or classics, neither of which I came anywhere close to majoring in. Instead, I majored in English, grew to love and understand that I could have a career doing natural resource management. So I went to graduate school and uh, got a natural resource policy degree and then moved to DC to put it to work. And I've been here and it'll be 30 years in 2026. Wow. But that is me. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Mary. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Erickson. I have a little bit of a cough today, so uh, that my apologies up front. I'm currently the forest supervisor on the Custer Gallatin National Forest based out of beautiful Bozeman, Montana. I'm on my 15th year here. You know, when you tell these things, you realize time goes by very quickly. And, uh, and I'm in my 39th year with the Forest Service, uh, started in 1984. And in this picture, which is also my high school yearbook shot that I didn't think I had, but I rediscovered, um, it's right before I am disappointing my parents who wanted me to go to Notre Dame or Georgetown and become a doctor. And I'm getting ready to move out to Oregon and go into forestry school, which made absolutely no sense to them uh, growing up in Wisconsin and upstate New York. Thanks, Mary. Um, that's great. <laughs> Um, all right, so last but not least is myself here. Um, my name is Liz Townley. I'm the Washington office wilderness and wild and scenic rivers planner um, located in Salmon, Idaho. Um, I've been in this line of work since I got out of college um, and got a job right away. So I guess that's working on like 13 or 14 years now. Um, in this picture, my date, Jackson Ewing, I don't think I have his permission to put this on a PowerPoint that's being recorded, but you know, maybe he'll never find out. Um, I didn't have a senior picture. I mean, I have one, but I couldn't find it. So you get prom. Um, and my goals were to go to art school. I specifically uh, had my eye on the Seattle Art Institute. Um, turns out I didn't get in. So um, there we are. <laughs> Um, all right, so thank you to the presenters. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, learning a little bit more about everyone here. And, um, you know, you can't go on a road trip without a good playlist, right? And so just for fun, if you wanna pop in the chat, you know, your favorite road trip destination, who you're with, or maybe a, a favorite playlist or song or two, please feel free. That's always a fun thing for us to read, to get to know you a little bit more. Um, so, <clears throat> what is our journey today? The best road trips or anything in life is about the journey and not the destination, right? Um, at least that's my philosophy. So uh, we're headed over to Canyon Country first to hear from Peter about all things wilderness. Um, next, we're going to go to the Sierra and Sequoia National Forests and um, talk with Steve about rivers. And then last but not least, we're going to have a stop in Bozeman to visit with Mary about her experiences managing diverse landscapes. So buckle up. And if that doesn't win the best pun of the day, that's my best material. I don't know what will. Um, so when I, I was thinking about this presentation on a recent um, road trip that I took with my family this spring break, uh, and we went down to Moab for some desert fun. And um, I knew we were gonna be instructing this course and I was trying to think about some good examples of places with you know, mixed ownership, um, many different designation statuses and, and basically a lot going on. Um, and there's many places throughout the agency to find such a place, right? But on the way down, while my husband was driving, I was picking out, you know, all the different hikes we're gonna do and the different rides we're gonna do. And I realized, Moab's the perfect place to use as an example for one part of this uh, presentation. And that's because, um, you know, the words you can see on the slide here are all in a rather small area surrounding Moab, um, which can be seen on this next slide here. 
So as you can see, um, you know, we've now arrived in Moab here on our road trip together. Um, and we've got National Park Service administered lands. We've got Forest Service, BLM, and state. Uh, we've got different designations like wilderness, national recreation area, recommended wilderness, wilderness study areas. Um, and all of these terms um, and designations can be incredibly confusing and difficult to understand. I think we can all agree with that, right? And this is at that 30,000 foot level. So zoom in and there are signs about camp here, don't camp there, bikes here, no bikes there, dogs on leashes, no dogs at all. And so for some, I think this can be a real barrier to accessing um, our public lands. Peter, you might wanna mute yourself. Okay, there we go. <laughs> but with education, consistent messaging and breaking down some of these complex terms and processes like we're doing today, um, you know, behind these designations and these land allocations, I think we can better manage the landscape um, and the resources contained with them that, within them um, and provide that world-class opportunity to the publics that we serve and, and to the resources that we manage. And so with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Peter, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the wilderness uh, side of things. Thanks, Liz. I, I first wanna thank Liz for ch her choice of Moab as the destination of the first road trip. So as Liz mentioned, she took a road, uh, road trip with her family uh, early this spring. It turns out that I took a road trip with my family a few years ago, and I also lived there after college, which is one of the job experiences that really introduced me to wilderness management as a career uh, and, and explains a lot about why I'm here today doing what I do. So, okay, this is the third and last day of a wilderness conference. So I, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that most of you know by now what congressionally designated wilderness is, but in case you're joining us for the first time, wilderness is a parcel of federal land that Congress has designated that meets certain criteria under the Wilderness Act of 1964. Congress and only Congress can designate wilderness, and, and it does so pretty faithfully using the criteria set out by the Wilderness Act. And the principal mandate of the Wilderness Act for those agencies who manage wilderness, which are BLM, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service from the Department of the Interior and the US Forest Service from the Department of Agriculture. Regardless of the agency, the mandate is the same and that is to preserve wilderness character. And if there's a conflict between preserving wilderness character and something else, preserving wilderness character wins out. So um, I just mentioned that Congress and only Congress can designate a wilderness, but that begs the question, how does Congress do that? So uh, let us move on to the next slide, please, Liz. So I'm gonna give you the very textbook version for how Congress designates wilderness. And it's basically, the, the schoolhouse rock version of how a bill becomes a law because it's the same process. I say textbook and typically because there are lots of one-offs, lots of exceptions, lots of real life instances where the process has been different and in some cases quite different because life is messy and so is Congress. But I'll stick to kind of the garden variety process. So four steps and it starts with someone submits a recommendation for an area or areas to be designated as wilderness. So it can start from a number of different sources. Typically these days, it's a nonprofit group, an environmental group who go out, gather their data and draw lines on a map for those areas of federal land that they believe meet the criteria of wilderness. And I'll go into those criteria in a little bit. It could be an individual just going out there and hand, you're making lines on a map with a Sharpie and a highlighter and sending them into Congress. And there's plenty of precedent for that. There's also precedent for members of Congress themselves coming up with a proposal for wilderness designation. But whatever the source, the recommendation ultimately comes to Congress and whoever receives it can take it up or 
presumably they could just stick it in a drawer. But let's presume for the purposes of this example that Congress takes up the recommendation. Usually the, the, um, the work is tasked to the relevant committee for wilderness legislation. The relevant committees of jurisdiction in the House is the House uh, Committee on Natural Resources and its counterpart in the Senate is the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. So they may uh, request reports, they may hold markups, basically uh, soliciting expert testimony, calling witnesses, and basically testing, testing the bill, making sure that its provisions are sound. Uh, many bills do, do, do not become law. Most bills do not become law. But those that do, ultimately, both chambers of Congress the House and the Senate vote on the same exact bill text. And only if that happens, again, typically, does a bill become a law, or I should say, is a bill enacted by Congress, at which point it goes to the president for signature. Typically, there are some other ways in which a bill enacted by Congress can become law, but by and large, it, it is approved by the president's signature. Uh, so once that is done, those areas that have been uh, described and usually depicted on a map accompanying the legislation, those areas instantly become congressionally designated wilderness upon the, the signature by the president. So that's the process. Now let's talk about the, the five qualities that comprise, that together, comprise what we call wilderness character. The Wilderness Act is an incredibly well-written piece of legislation and it went through 60 some odd drafts before being enacted. So it's one of the most picked over debated pieces of federal law. Having said that, it's not perfect and no law can ever be perfect. It doesn't really spell out in any detail what constitutes wilderness character. It uses that phrase a lot, but it doesn't, it, it didn't necessarily spell out altogether clearly what goes into wilderness character and what does an area have to have? What are some nice to have features? So there are four mandatory qualities of wilderness character that an area must have to be found to be eligible. And there's a fifth optional category that's a bit of a catch-all. So I'll start with the one on the bottom left, the natural quality, I think relatively easy to grasp. It's an area that displays a high degree of apparent naturalness. We say apparent naturalness in case someone who is, let's say, not from the area, if they were to be taken out, they would find that the area looks to be highly natural as opposed to a, a mall in a city. And then skipping to the sort of, um, not quite the top left, the undeveloped quality. Again, I think that's relatively intuitive. It is an area that is um, primarily free from the signs of, of humans uh, built environment, right? So there's not roads, bridges. Uh, again, generally, there are exceptions. You'll find some weird uh, things that exist in wilderness, but by and large, these areas are free of development. Moving to the upper left, it's the quality that I think is the most difficult to understand, and that is untrammeled. It's not a synonym for undeveloped. It's not a synonym for natural. It, uh, a trammel literally is a net. Um, so for something to be trammeled, it is metaphorically to have a net thrown over it, or to uh, I think it also has some derivation of the hobbling of a horse. So something that is untrammeled is unconfined. It has is, it is not been contained. And so a trammeling action, as wilderness managers call it, is an action that intentionally manipulates the, uh, the biophysical environment of, of the, um, the area to be designated as wilderness. So, or it, it, let me say that again. For an area to be found uh, that meets the criteria, it should, it should show a, a degree of, of um, untrammeled condition. Okay, so natural, undeveloped, untrammeled. The fourth and final mandatory quality is 
outstanding opportunities, and that is outstanding opportunities for solitude or outstanding opportunities for a primitive and, and unconfined recreation, hiking, backpacking, canoeing, whitewater rafting, horseback riding, and the like. Those are the four mandatory qualities. There's a fifth, doesn't have to be present, but if, if there are other features of value present in the area, and that area gets designated by Congress as wilderness, they, those other features of value must be managed, at, at, um, must be managed to preserve their, their current condition. Meaning, let's say an example of other feature of value is cultural resources. Say you have world-class thousand year old Anasazi petroglyphs, you know, rock art. Just because that quality didn't have to be found in the wilderness area, if it's there, you have to manage it just like it's a mandatory quality. So those, those five qualities together, if they are found together, or perhaps the area has no other features of value, those four qualities, when found together, an area meets the criteria to be designated by Congress as wilderness. So that's designated wilderness. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the other designations that, that Liz showed on her map of Moab. So I'm not gonna talk too much about these, but uh, since we've mentioned them, these other designations or some other designations are wilderness study areas, uh, roadless areas, inventoried roadless areas, which are unique to the Forest Service. And then Liz mentioned the National Recreation Area, which I view as a stand-in for all the other designations, all the other labels that are hung on public land. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that my family had gone on a spring break trip to Moab. That's a picture there uh, is a photo of my children um, from four years ago. Wilderness study, study areas, three agencies have them. Forest Service, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service. Fish and Wildlife Service, they don't track the exact number, but it's a, it's a relatively small number, it's double digits. And for Fish and Wildlife, it's um, WSAs are those areas that have been identified and established through the inventory component of a wilderness review. And they include all the areas that are still undergoing the wilderness review process at Fish. The, the, there, yeah, like I said, Fish and Wildlife does not have a bunch of those. Unlike BLM, which has a ton of them, has almost 500 wilderness study areas, the, the way BLM's WSAs have come into being is that Congress basically tasked BLM with doing an inventory to see which of its lands met the criteria of, of uh, wilderness under the Wilderness Act and the resulting areas that BLM found had those characteristics, sorry, those areas that, that met the criteria and that the BLM um, found to be, well, actually, you know what? Let me just keep it simple. Areas that met the criteria became wilderness study areas after going through a 15 year process. Park service, it's very easy. They don't have WSAs. Inventoried roadless areas. This is a unique uh, allocation or designation unique to the forest service. Just to be clear, the program that Steve, Liz, and I work for does not manage these. So I'm mentioning them only because it's the kind of thing that people might understandably confuse with wilderness or think of in the same breath. But do not confuse them for wilderness there. They have been uh, administratively set aside and um, Sorry. Yeah, they offer similar opportunities for wilderness experiences, but also provide opportunities for recreational activities that are incompatible with wilderness, like mountain biking and OHV use. And then the sort of the everything else category, the national recreation area that Liz mentioned on that map of Moab in the vicinity is the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. That's about 1.2 million acres. And the first one was in, designated, I think, in the 1970s in Idaho, the Sawtooth National Recreation Area. There are lots and lots of other designations. They are fascinating, but I think for the purposes of this presentation, I'll leave it there. I do want to talk about one other type, and that is recommended wilderness. Now I'm only going to talk about Forest Service. It gets too complicated if I start talking about 
what this label means for other agencies. For Forest Service, recommended wilderness is an area that we identify during the forest planning process. Um, there is a four step process that we go, go through for purposes of time. Um, let me just skip to the sort of the bottom line, which is any area that is identified through the forest planning process as a quote unquote recommended wilderness, we manage consistent with that forest plan to preserve wilderness characteristics until either Congress designates that recommended wilderness as formally congressionally designated wilderness or they release that area for other uses. Now, some of you may have noticed I've been using the term wilderness characteristics at time and wilderness character at other times. This distinction is not a semantic one. It gets nuanced and um, I would say kind of obscure very quickly, but I think the, the quickest way to try to distinguish the two is wilderness characteristics are the individual constituent parts, which if they are found all in the same plot of land, together they, they constitute wilderness character with the one important caveat, wilderness character is only something that you find when Congress has acted to designate an area as wilderness. So an area can have all the characteristics of wilderness, but if Congress has not said, this is now the Liz Townley wilderness area, you cannot claim that, that area as, as having quote unquote wilderness character. If Congress tomorrow were to designate the Liz Townley wilderness, then guess what? That area is wilderness character. I, that, that, that to me is almost too fine a distinction, but it, it, it is what it is and we have to abide by it. All right, next slide please, Liz. Okay, so these, these areas that sort of are the ones that I, I think you will come across the most, wilderness, wilderness study areas and recommended wilderness. These key distinctions are listed here. I don't think it makes for good viewing if I read all of them, but just the high points are wilderness, as I mentioned already, are designated by Congress. Wilderness study areas, basically those areas that Congress said, you know, hey, administering agency, study your lands to see if any of them qualify. And then we, Congress, may or may not take you up on that recommendation. And then recommended wilderness, as I mentioned, for the Forest Service at least, are those areas that we recommend to the secretary as suitable for designation. We manage them consistent with the forest plan wherever they've been, in which they've been identified. And we manage our recommended wilderness areas to preserve the wilderness characteristics we have identified during the evaluation process. And as I mentioned before, in recommended wilderness, there are some uses that are incompatible under the Wilderness Act. And though such incompatible uses may be allowed as long as the wilderness characteristics are retained. So for example, uh, strip mining for coal would probably not qualify as an inconsistent use that could be allowed. But OHV use, if it weren't just crazy out of control, could be curtailed, could be, uh, could be, the use could be stopped, roads could be closed um, if the area were to be designated as wilderness. So that's, those, those are the big three, I think the big three that you will see if you're um, a new manager or new to the federal government. And uh, let us, um, let's skip on to the next slide, please. So I will turn it back to Liz in a moment, but let's take a quick trivia break. The question, what state, which states have the most wilderness acres? Okay, the winner is Alaska. Um, that's a figure I've written down somewhere else, but I think it's 57 plus million acres. Second up is California with 15 plus million acres, if I'm remembering correctly. And coming in third, quite a distant third, is Idaho 
Uh, I think it's at four plus million acres, but Liz, Idaho resident, can you confirm or deny that? I can't, it's uh, 4.7 million. Okay. Mm -hmm. So good job all, and thank you for playing. I thank you for listening. I appreciate your interest in this topic and I'll turn it back to Liz, Liz. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, so now that we spent some time in the desert looking at wilderness, we're gonna head west to the giant sequoia trees and abundance of clean, clear water on the Sierra and Sequoia National Forests. That's us. We're taking a non-direct route so that we can go on the loneliest highway through Nevada and see the shoe tree. If anyone's ever seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So <clears throat> the Sierra Sequoia National Forests are nearly completed with revising their forest plan. Um, Peter talked a little bit about forest plans earlier. Um, and what this plan provides is direction for the management of all resources in national forests, but it also identifies areas for recommended wilderness and eligible and wild scenic rivers. So when looking at a forest with a lot going on, like we were looking at for, you know, um, an area with a lot of different land status designations, um, we were looking for something with a lot of going on rivers wise, um, and the Sierra and Sequoia are great examples. So you can see um, the blue lines are designated wild and scenic rivers on this map, and those are mostly the Kern and Kings rivers. Um, but there are all those orange lines going on as well. And so those rivers have been identified as eligible. And our next driver, Steve, is going to talk a little bit more about the river side of things and what all of this terminology means. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide here. So uh, building off of what Peter shared uh, about wilderness and the Wilderness Act, uh, I'm going to uh, dive into some more specifics about wild and scenic rivers as well as eligible and suitable rivers. Uh, there's, there's some parallels uh, to wilderness and the Wilderness Act and, and some uh, key distinctions as well. Uh, so, so starting with the uh, signing of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, uh, a little bit over four years after the signing of the Wilderness Act, uh, it was signed on October 2nd, 1968, uh, the same day as the National Trail System Act. So another a system of national designations uh, that we're not going to talk about in too much detail uh, uh, during this presentation, but uh, certainly historic that, that two national systems were signed into law uh, by President Johnson on the same day uh, in 1968. Uh, you see here uh, some of the, the opening provisions of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act on the screen, uh, in, including the highlighted portion uh, which I've highlighted in part because there is a, a similarity there with some of the language of the Wilderness Act, talking about uh, benefit, uh, protection for the benefit of present and future generations. Uh, and uh, so that's a key component of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, uh, along with the Wilderness Act. And in the case of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, it was established uh, to complement the policy of dam development and other river development that the country, country had um, uh, historically relied on. Uh, and there was a recognition that along with the, those key uses for river resources, that there also needed to be a system for protecting certain segments of rivers uh, in, in a free flowing condition and to protect their other, their other values for, again, the present, uh, uh, in future generations. And uh, another similarity uh, between wilderness, wild, and scenic rivers is uh, these acts establish national systems that are managed interagency. And it's actually the same four uh, federal agencies that manage the national wild and scenic river system uh, as the National Wilderness Preservation System, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Forest Service. Uh, although there are um, also uh, wild and scenic rivers established under the national system that are managed by tribes, managed by states, as well as locally administered wild and scenic rivers, all part of this national system. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see here featured uh, uh, where we are on a road trip, the, the Kern River, which was designated by Congress 151 miles uh, in 1987 and is administer, administered both by the Sequoia National Forest 
uh, and the Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park. So another, another parallel with what Peter described uh, for wilderness is, is how a wild and scenic river becomes designated. At least one of the ways it becomes designated is through congressional designation uh, and a very similar path uh, as what Peter described earlier with wilderness proposals for de designation with a bill being introduced into Congress. Oftentimes, uh, you, know, uh, you have a grassroots campaign and uh, a member of the, the delegation from the area or multiple members sponsor and introduce the bill. Uh, you have subcommittee hearings where often uh, agencies uh, associated with the designations are asked to testify as well as other, other stakeholders uh, that have an interest in, in the designations. And then ultimately, uh, uh, if it's voted out of committee, then it goes to a general vote in uh, both chambers of Congress. And if makes it through there, then uh, can be signed into law by the president. But there's also uh, another way that wild and scenic rivers get designated, and that's through uh, a provision under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, Section 2AII, uh, the secretary, uh, secretarial designations. And while both the Secretary of Interior and the Secretary of Agriculture uh, are charged with administering uh, uh, components of the National Wild and Scenic River System, the authority to designate actually is limited to the Secretary of Interior. And it's through a process where uh, a river has a, a protected status uh, under a state legislature. We have lots of uh, similar uh, state-based river protection systems. Uh, uh, and so um, if a state has that or, or other protection measures in place, then a, a governor can choose uh, to submit an application to the Secretary of the Interior uh, for, um, to request that uh, rivers in, in that state be added to the National Wild and Scenic River System and receive the protections afforded under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And so it's the Park Service who's charged with uh, reviewing those applications uh, by the governor to determine that they meet criteria for the, the system. And it's, that's a public process uh, public comments received and a decision ultimately by the secretary uh, on whether to to designate or not with that with rather than uh, an additional piece of legislation passed it's actually uh, the approval uh, published in, as a federal register notice and so a little bit to the north of where we are on a road trip now we've got several rivers that were designated by the Secretary of Interior back in 1981 through this process, including the, the Klamath, Trinity, and Eel Rivers. So next slide. So, um, you know, whereas under the Wilderness Act, the, the focus is on preservation of wilderness character. Really the core of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is protection and enhancement of river values. And if you've attended any of the other Wild and Scenic River sessions, uh, during uh, NWSI or have any familiarity with the Wild and Scenic Rivers, uh, you've heard about these, these river values and the protection and enhancement mandate. Uh, and, and what those river values translate to, which ultimately comes from the language of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, is a river's free flowing condition, that it's existing in a natural uh, condition or relatively natural condition without impoundment, diversion, straightening, rip wrapping, or other modification of the waterway. Uh, it's water quality. Uh, it, Wild Scenic Rivers Act directs federal agencies to cooperate with EPA and, and state uh, water quality agencies to eliminate and diminish water pollution. And this, this act was passed uh, prior to the modern Clean Water Act. So water quality protection was not, not a given uh, in 1968. And then third is a term of art that Congress uh, developed uh, or that, uh, that was developed through the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And that's this uh, term, the outstandingly remarkable values, a superlative upon a superlative of, of these key values that are tailored to specific Wild and Scenic Rivers and, and are river related and a focus of, of protection along with water quality and free flowing condition. So uh, to talk a little bit more about those outstanding and remarkable values or, or what we uh, call them for short ORVs, uh, go to the next slide and you can see a number of the different uh, 
uh, ORVs identified under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, uh, uh, recreational, fish and wildlife, uh, geologic, cultural, historic, uh, and other similar values. So there's uh, also you know, a, an, an opening that Congress leaves to identify uh, other other values uh, determined, you know, during uh, a, a river focused process, you know, which it could include botany or hydrology, ecology, or, you know, uh, uh, a value we haven't identified yet, but may, may be something that is river related and, and is cru crucial to what distinguishes that particular wild and scenic river designation. So uh, another aspect of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and the National Wild and Scenic River System is that it sets up three different classifications of, of rivers. And um, along with having federal lands in Wild and Scenic River corridors, uh, these, these Wild and Scenic River corridors uh, actually flow across landscapes. And uh, in some cases don't have any federal lands. They could have private lands, they could have state lands. Uh, they, um, through uh, tribal reservations. And so with, with that, th those changing landscapes, there's also different levels of development uh, within the, the, these river corridors, different levels of access, uh, different water quality. And those are actually the, the criteria that play into the different classification systems. Uh, one of the more confusing aspects of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act is, is this classification system of wild, scenic, and recreational. And uh, it actually doesn't necessarily relate to the, the state of these, these rivers, although oftentimes wild rivers are flowing through, through wilderness areas. But in, in particular for scenic rivers, recreational rivers, they may not be any more scenic or have higher recreational value than other classifications. It's simply the, the classification system that was established under the act. Uh, based on, again, this level of development uh, in, in the corridors with wild rivers being least developed uh, uh, and uh, scenic having intermediate development, some, some access points um, by uh, rail or, or a car in addition to foot, uh, as well as recreational rivers, which can have a lot of development, including highways going right through the corridor. So a couple uh, planning requirements that are key for congressionally designated wild and scenic rivers, these actually don't apply to the secretarially designated rivers, um, but the requirements under the act for, I mentioned these river corridors uh, and uh, the federal river administering agencies are required to establish detailed river corridor boundaries for these areas. Uh, oftentimes it's uh, about a quarter mile on each side of, of the river corridor. Um, and an interim boundary is established, but then there's opportunities to adjust uh, to best meet the, the needs of the particular river management for that area, the particular river management approach for the area, depending on the river values. And so adjustments can be made and, and finalizing a river corridor boundary as long as it in most cases doesn't exceed 320 acres per river mile on average. And oftentimes that, that work is done in, in connection with the development of a comprehensive river management plan, which really charts the course for how a specific wild and scenic river is managed. Uh, we've got a national system, we've got this unifying factor of protect and enhance uh, the river values, but every wild and scenic river is un unique and every Therefore, every wild and scenic river requires a unique management approach to best protect and enhance those values. And so that, that, is, um, that planning approach is developed through a, a public process uh, to develop a comprehensive river management plan, look at things like the development in the corridor, monitoring needs, water quality and flow needs, uh, what sort of user capacity can, uh, can be accommodated uh, in the river corridor without negatively impacting the river values. And that's a process where state and local governments, uh, tribes are uh, engaged as well as members of the public to ultimately uh, come up with a plan for how, the, how this designation will be managed as a wild and scenic river. So to, to recap here for, for 
balancing for designations, two, two ways for that, those rivers to be added to the national system, either by Congress or the Secretary of Interior. Um, ultimately, statutory protections uh, to protect and enhance the river values, free flowing condition and water quality and outstanding remarkable values. And then uh, a management plan and river corridor boundary is, is required to chart the course for uh, stewardship of, of these designations. So now I'll, I'll shift over to the other side of things, pre-designation uh, study rivers. Uh, and uh, there are also provisions in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act that uh, uh, form the foundation for additions of future rivers, uh, in particular through, through study by um, by agencies and uh, through other public processes. And so section one of the act highlights that the, the system is, is established and it's, it's one where there are standards for adding rivers in the future. Back in 1968, Congress added eight, eight uh, rivers uh, right away, uh, but both identified rivers for study and also um, envisioned future growth to this national system. And so, um, Section 5A uh, established uh, provisions um, where Congress specifically authorized or identified rivers for study. There were 27 initial study rivers, and then through uh, subsequent legislation, other rivers have been identified by Congress for study. And that's you know, somewhat comparable to when you think about wilderness study areas. The Congress is mandating that the agencies study these areas and, and provide recommendations on whether they should be designated or not. There's also a provision in the Wild and Rivers Act that calls for agencies to uh, study other, other rivers as, as part of uh, their regular federal land and resource management planning processes. And, and that those are called uh, agency authorized or 5B1 study rivers. So whether it's uh, a 5A or a 5B1 study process, um, generally, all four uh, uh, river administering agencies follow the same study process. Uh, you know, I'll, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the Forest Service uh, policy approach to to studying rivers eligibility and suitability. But ultimately, uh, there is a lot of consistency across all four federal agencies, in particular due to some of the work of the Interagency Wild and Scenic River Reporting Council and. Uh, a technical uh, paper developed years ago about the study process that really forms a foundation for uh, primarily a lot of consistency across how we approach study of rivers across the system, uh, expanding upon both what is spelled out in the act and, and where there is room for agency discretion. But in, in, in uh, across the agencies, it's a generally three-step process where uh, first, the river is studied for eligibility as sort of inventory step of whether they meet certain criteria. Uh, and if so, they're found eligible. And there's a preliminary classification of assigning wild, scenic, or recreational classifications to those eligible rivers. And then the final step in, in the study process is a, is a suitability determination, which uh, analyzes a number of different factors um, and uh, leads to a development of alternatives and uh, a decision by the agency uh, with a recommendation to Congress. So going, starting with eligibility, the first step in the study process, uh, this is, and, and this is where, um, you know, for instance, in, in forest plan revisions, uh, the forest, ser forest service policy is, is to, uh, for um, all rivers to be looked at or re-inventoried for eligibility during land management planning processes or forest plan revisions. And so that consists of an eligibility inventory where an inter interdisciplinary team looks at all the named rivers on, on uh, the, the National Forest Unit uh, and determines whether those rivers are free flowing and contain at least one outstandingly remarkable value, uh, which I mentioned earlier. You know, those are, so those are two of the three river values form the criteria for wild and scenic river um, eligibility. Uh, what, what makes a, an outstandingly remarkable value, an outstandingly remarkable value, 
uh, that uh, includes whether it's river related as well as if it's unique, rare, or exemplary within a region of comparison. Uh, those regions of comparison are established by the, the interdisciplinary teams or responsible official with a, a given planning effort and can, is essentially can uh, vary from across ORV categories or it can be uh, similar across ORV categories, but ultimately it's about determining an appropriate level um, and scale for the river to be evaluated. It could be at a uh, eco-regional approach, it could be at a forest approach, it could be at a state, state level, um, but ultimately it's about establishing re meaningful levels of comparison to determine which rivers have these really unique, rare, exemplary values in comparison to other similar rivers. And this process, while it is sort of an objective-based criteria uh, to go through it, um, you know, if it's if it's free-flowing, if it contains one or more ORVs, then it's eligible. Uh, it, it still relies on professional judgment of the agency informed by best available scientific information and, and public input about you know whether these these rivers meet these these criteria. So. Um, if a river is identified as eligible, uh, then uh, at that point, um, uh, from the standpoint of um, the, these five D1 rivers, you know, where, where it's for agency identified to study rivers, then there are policy protections that, that kick in under any agency's given policy. Uh, but ultimately, primarily, uh, there's consistency there again and it's focused on maintaining that, that, that river's free flowing condition and protecting the ORVs. So essentially uh, uh, maintaining protections for those areas on an interim basis until Congress acts. So then um, going to the, the, the suitability step and for uh, the Forest Service, um, there is, uh, the agency policy provides discretion about whether that be completed during the forest uh, plan revision process um, or deferred to another time. Uh, uh, federal agencies differ specifically on the timing of suitability studies, but that's that's the Forest Service policy. It can be done during during forest plan revision, or it can be deferred till another time, including if uh, a a project or an activity is proposed on. Uh, the eligible river that could uh, potentially adversely affect uh, the values, that free flowing condition that those ORVs, then that can lead to a triggering of the need to complete a suitability study before a project or to move forward. Uh, but ultimately, if a suitability, if and when a suitability study is done, it really focuses on, okay, we've got these identified river values for these eligible segments. Are those, uh, River values best protected through wild and through the National Wild and Scenic River System, or are there other uses and needs for the river that don't make it a, a good fit for the, the national system? Uh, whether a river is identified as eligible or suitable uh, under Forest Service policy, again, the, the same interim protection measures apply, um, uh, giving Congress time to act and 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 ensuring that the agency continues to protect those river values until then. Uh, this is a, a step, though, where there are development of alternatives, um, you know, for whether an agency would find a river or rivers uh, suitable or not suitable, um, and uh, providing the basis for a uh, recommendation to Congress on future designation. I should also say for Forest Service policy, if a river is found not suitable, uh, then it is no longer protected as an eligible river. Um, unless it is, uh, and there's some nuance here, unless it's one where Congress has asked the, the agency to study the river, those 5A rivers, and then in that case, their protections continue for three more years after a, uh, uh, a study is transmitted to Congress. So in, in summary, some, some uh, the distinctions between designated wild and scenic rivers as well as eligible and suitable rivers, uh, you've got the you know, different ways that wild and scenic rivers are designated, ultimately fall under the, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act requirements, those statutory protections to protect and enhance river values, with different planning requirements like boundaries and comprehensive river management plans. 
eligible and suitable river processes. These are either identified by the agency or by Congress for study. Uh, man, need to be managed consistent uh, in the case of Forest Service administered rivers with forest plan direction. Um, in the case of rivers that are identified uh, for study by Congress, those 5A rivers, there are also a couple of key statutory protections during that time period I mentioned previously uh, until three years after uh, a study is, is transmitted to Congress. But ultimately, uh, that, that management focuses on protection of the river values in, until Congress acts. Uh, and the focus there is on interim boundaries um, of the um, eligible or suitable wild and scenic river. Okay, so which brings us to our trivia break before I turn the keys and wheel back over to Liz. And so as with your wilderness question, please feel free to pop your guesses into the chat of which two wild and scenic rivers lay competing claims to have the deepest river canyon in the United States. Well, for purposes of time, we'll keep things moving. Phil, you got one of the, the, the answers correct. The snake uh, is one of the rivers uh, uh, through Hell's Canyon. Um, the other uh, being um, the Kings River, uh, where, where we are on our road trip right now in, in California, on um, Sequoia uh, National Forest, Sequoia Kings Canyon. Uh, and it ultimately depends on how you define a canyon and its depth. For instance, the Snake River through Hell's Canyon uh, has a peak on one side that's uh, 7,900 feet above the water and six miles away, and on the other side, 4,500 feet uh, above the water. Whereas in Kings River, uh, there's a, uh, the highest peak is about 8,200 feet away and four miles away from the river. And on the other side of the river, it's about 4,500 feet away. So depending on who you ask and who you talk to, um, you have two different answers for the deepest river canyon in the United States. Thanks, Steve. Um, that was great. So, our last leg of our journey here is to travel from the Sierra and Sequoia National Forests um, and go visit our friend Mary over in Bozeman uh, with the Custer Gallatin National Forest. Um, so with a brand new forest plan and some of the most iconic landscapes in the national forest system, Mary's got a lot on her plate. Um, she's one of those forests that has a lot going on, uh, but I'll let her go into the details of that. So Mary, uh, yeah, go ahead. Great, thanks, Liz. And um, I know we're getting at the end of the presentation. And my uh, my disclaim I have two disclaimers. One is I realized as I was listening to uh, Peter and Steve, uh, when you and all the policy and all the wealth of of uh, background we have, and then you you sometimes bring that into the world of managers. And sometimes our you know we we're messier. Our terminology may not be perfect. Um, kind of the lens through which we look through things is both the policy and maybe the trying to figure that out in the pragmatic sense. But I'm gonna take you on, um, on a tour of our forest plan decision on the Custer Gallatin. And I'm not gonna to dive too deep because I'm really using this as a little bit of a vignette of the management lens on how you think about kind of special designations. And yeah, and so Liz threw down the gauntlet to, in this challenge to me where where in the questions she had, I was supposed to make you really excited about uh, forest planning and planning processes and, and make the connection about why this is important to you. So not sure if I'll, uh, I'll achieve that, but I'll try. So, uh, you know, I, I started my career 39 years ago on the Wainema National Forest in, in Southern Oregon, and I started on a plan revision team. So I've, I've always been interested in forest planning, um, but, but then over my career, I've mostly been in, in Forest Service line officer positions as a district ranger, deputy forest supervisor, forest supervisor in Utah, and then on the Gallatin and then the Custer Gallatin here in Montana. When I got the job on the, originally it was on the Gallatin in 2007, I, I just felt like, wow, the what an honor to be on this landscape in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in Montana. And a year later, the supervisor on the Custer retired and we were going through some organizational changes as an agency. And, so we started down this path of um, shared leadership between the two forests. And a number of years later, we became a consolidated unit. So the Custer Gallatin is a beautiful 3 million acre landscape that stretches about 500 miles from end to end. It's a, 
It's as diverse, I think, as any in the system. It's awe-inspiring. And sometimes it's a little bit of an unwieldy landscape. Um, and you know, we always talk about in the planning process, we worked with 14 counties across two states, 19 tribal nations, um, uh, just, just a lot of interest in this landscape. So I said I start, I like forest planning. But when I got to the forest in 2007, forest plan revision for these forests seemed like it was quite a ways out and it wasn't really on my radar screen. But as I stayed here longer and I, I love this place, uh, you know, we started getting in the queue for revising our forest plans. And uh, the two forests were officially consolidated as into one administrative unit in 2014. And then we started into plan revision in 2016. And that, that charge was to bring the, <coughs> the existing plans together and, and keep that on track originally with a four year time frame. We ended up finishing that in six years. Although we feel like that's still pretty darn good because in the middle of that, we had government furloughs and fire transfer and um, you know, changes in administration and a lot of other complexity. But we were pretty excited. We got the plan decision to the finish line and I signed the record of decision for our new plan just four months ago. So some of the questions are about, you know, what are we seeing as we implement the new plan? And I'd say we're, we're really in the very early stages of that. So, you know, part of the reason I like planning processes is not necessarily, I'm not necessarily the strongest person in the world on the policy framework and the, the technical aspects. I love I love when you talk to people and try to engage people on the value of these public lands and what matters and why we do the things we do as an agency. So for me, it's that chance to bring people together and look at longer term issues that often on a particular national forest, we don't talk to people about. We talk to people about this project, but not what's the big strategy, where are we going with that national forest? And, and then also that ability to weave in sense of place. And again, the directives for the planning process are well over 700 pages. And I probably would am remiss in admitting this, but I never read all the directives for plan revision, but I had a fantastic um, team leader and planning team and folks who um, read and implemented all those. But we set out in that planning process with the desire to really engage people across that, that 500 mile landscape and, and show up and recognize that the little town of Ekalaka, Montana is different than Big Sky and different than Bozeman. And, and we can't engage with people from where just where the supervisor's office is. And, and the example I always gave as we work through it is every time we would have a key point where we wanted to really engage with the public, it would be 15 communities and three weeks in process to get out and travel and, and set up and, you know, engage with those communities and, um, and really try to do those road trips and show up in every community. So you start into a forest planning process and you, you know, you're kind of excited about what is a forest plan and it's this comprehensive vision and guiding document for a particular national forest. And it has a lot in it. It's the integration of new science, that guidance, that forest wide direction, and in our case direction by geographic areas of the forest. And so, you know, it's a plan is there's a lot in there and it's pretty deep. And we and then we also recognize the minute you went into the public part of the planning process and the engagement, people care. The two biggest issues we had in our process from the very beginning were what's the this national forest role in bison management? And then on top of that, what what designation should we bring forward around what recommended wilderness? And people cared and Fought and gave us lots and lots of input on designated areas. And, and when you go into a forest planning process, the foundation already exists, right? You're already starting with an existing plan. Our plans were 80s vintage plans, but you, you have existing plans, you have congressional decisions, you have all these designated areas that already exist. In our case, we have designated wilderness in the Lee Metcalf and the um, Absorca Beartooth, a huge wilderness area. We have a WSA, a wilderness study area that was designated in 1977. We have wildlife management areas that were also legislatively designated. We have a wild horse range, scenic and historic trails. So you have all of those going into the process. And, and then you're starting to think about that's your foundation. And you're starting to think about what's the overlay on top of that. Okay, next slide. So uh, don't expect people to absorb all this, but this just gives a sense of, of some of the designated areas we landed on. And I know this session is about wilderness and wild and scenic rivers, but 
as I think about this as a land manager, I, to me, it's the designated areas and the way you reach decisions. It's really formed, it's in the context of kind of that fabric, that quilt of all the other designations, the one that exists, the ones that exist ahead of time and the ones that come up and that you develop through this planning process. So again, I'm just gonna highlight a few. We ended up with eight new recommended wilderness areas in addition to the wilderness, you know, the 1.2 million acres of wilderness that we already have on the forest. We had 30 eligible wild and scenic rivers. And I'll speak to some of that uh, in a little bit on the next slide. We ended up with a designation called backcountry that was really a way of thinking about what, what areas were really appropriate for recommended wilderness. And when I say appropriate, that's through our lens of where we landed um, because people have very differing views on that. But we ended up with a backcountry designation for places where we wanted to maintain that current sense of place and their character, but we wanted to have more management flexibility. And in particular, they were areas that already had some existing uses, in our case, principally um, mountain bike use. And we worked with the Center for Large Gate large landscape conservation and have this new designation around key linkage areas that link the, um, the parts of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem of the forest through toward the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. We have designations around this still water complex, this platinum palladium ore body, recreation emphasis areas, riparian management zones, and a lot of other designations in the mix. So again, my, my point here is just that for, for us and where we landed as a decision, it's really, it's all of it and kind of thinking about how it all fits together. People are really passionate about these topics and at least in our area, and I suspect this is probably most areas in the Forest Service, they're fairly polarized in their views on, on new designated areas. I, I would say in my experience in general, now I, I think about my time in Southern Utah, this probably doesn't fit, but in general in a place like this in the, on the Custer Gallatin, most people are actually accepting and appreciative of existing wilderness, existing designated areas, right? They, they've been there for a while. They, they recognize the value those bring for communities and, and, the, and how they fit within the system. It's always this context of what, how do you start to think about what you add in addition and how that, how that fits and what that does to people's existing uses. So, uh, you know, we the this whole topic about designated areas and particularly around recommended wilderness was pretty polarized, but was a huge topic from the very beginning. In general, on the people who wanted to see more recommended wilderness, it was it was maybe less nuanced than we wished it was. Um, generally, we a lot of the sentiment was everything that currently has wilderness characteristics in our inventory ought to be left and maintained that way. Um, and, and it ought to be considered recommended wilderness. And then of course, on the other side of that, um, people from uh, the kind of the motorized recreation community or others who felt disenfranchised with, uh, with wilderness designations were very passionate in their opposition. And I always use this example, early in the process, I had a civil rights uh, complaint lodged against me for actually having recommended wilderness areas proposed in our forest planning process. Uh, that, you know, that we, the agency takes those seriously, work through that, clearly a part of our process um, and, and in policy when you think about plan revision. But, but I'm sure the, the person who put forth that complaint uh, really felt uh, very strongly about it. And of course, when you thought about our wilderness, our in lands that were inventoried, and then what came forward in our range of alternatives in the final decision, lots of different viewpoints and theories, uh, both about the technical classification of areas, whether they were eligible rivers or lands with wilderness characteristics, um, and also a lot of different views on how they ought to be managed. So this is just a snapshot of some of our areas. And again, there's many, many across the board. Um, you know, where we landed, I, I felt was a pretty complex um, balance in considerations in the forest planning process before we had reached a decision, we actually had the, the newest designated wild and scenic river in the system in Montana, the East Rosebud Wild and Scenic River, supported by our congressional delegation in a very nonpartisan or bipartisan way. So that was fantastic. In terms of where we landed with the decision in the final plan, we had, we had a land, uh, a mountain range called the Crazies, uh, very much a product of 
the railroad grant history, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful high peaks, complex landscape, and tremendous checkerboard ownership has never had a recommendation for, it has never had any recommended wilderness in the past. And we ended up with a recommendation for a smaller recommended wilderness area on the south end and carving out kind of a backcountry area in that to start to, to set the stage of maintaining a sense of character for the future rounds. Of course, we have the Zorka Baratooth Wilderness at the core, lots and lots of eligible wild and scenic rivers from the Stillwater to the Yellowstone River to the Boulder River and many smaller rivers and tributaries in between. Had recommended wilderness in the Prior Mountains. That's a pretty unique mountain range. And then an underlay and probably one of the areas of the most interest and controversy is, uh, I mentioned at the start, we have a wilderness study area that Congress designated in 1977. The agency was asked to maintain circa 1977 wilderness character, but we were also were told that existing uses could continue and we needed to balance that. And we've had 40 plus years of litigation and controversy on that. And we made a recommendation for wilderness at the core of that wilderness study area and some other designations around the perimeter that we felt really balanced that sense of place and, and balanced our needs for management flexibility. But that, that piece is fairly controversial, fairly controversial. And the thing we always point out to people is that area remains a wilderness study area, irregardless of where we landed in forest plan revision. But I think sometimes when people think about it, they, they miss that. Okay, let's see. Um, you know, when you when you reach decisions on this, you know, there's there is no absolute consensus on any decisions. Eventually, it's just trying to make a, a thoughtful choice and really um, try to think about what you heard and what's important and what the agency needs are. I would also do a shout out, though there's never internal consensus. It was really important to me in this process that. that people at the district level, our program managers, our staff officers, our district rangers, that everyone was really engaged and we had that thought process feeding into the final decision. Um, post decision, uh, there's a lot of work to do on implementing the plan. And as you'd expect on a complex landscape like this, um, we're also starting to see some moves toward uh, legislative proposals. There's a bill to designate a new wild and scenic rivers on this landscape, that bill goes beyond the areas that we found to be, the rivers that we found to be eligible, not by a large margin, but some areas that we didn't find eligible for you know, uh, particular outstandingly remarkable value. Um, others disagreed. And again, we worked with those folks collaboratively through the process and um, it wasn't an, it's not an adversarial disagreement at all, but you're seeing a legislative proposal with the Headwaters Act um, that's, kind of coming through a congressional process now. I, I'm not making any predictions, but just this week, we were asked to work with legislative affairs and you know, give some review of, of where we might, where the administration might um, come out on testimony on that. Uh, we had support for our final plan from many, many corners on innovative approaches and collaboration and our, the involvement we had. But, it, and I, again, I think just because I find the social side of this so interesting, we. We had entities who really collaborated both with the Forest Service in this process, but tried to think about proposals that they would bring forward where they collaborated with people who had different interests, particularly around recommended wilderness and other designations. And then we had others who, you know, maybe more, what I'd say, maybe more strident wilderness um, advocates who, you know, who brought forth proposals and, and really remained very pure, purist in their proposals. And when we made a decision, obviously you don't make everyone happy and, and you're starting to see this, this interesting, I find it a little odd dynamic where even within the wilderness advocacy community, there's a little bit of finger pointing and, and fighting less directed at the agency and more disagreements um, amongst themselves about you know, how they participated in the process and where the Forest Service landed and whether um, those who worked with others and compromised in some proposals were sellouts or whether compromise was all part of the process. Okay, my last thing, because I don't get short on time, is uh, why should you care as uh, uh, wilderness uh, field professionals and others who care uh, deeply about uh, wild and scenic rivers and wilderness? Well, I don't, you know, it depends on where people are, but I, you know, the most basic, you, you should care because you can 
and should influence decisions that are made for these designations. You can't make these as a forest supervisor in a vacuum. You really need to have knowledge from people and, and did spend a lot of time. I tried to get out in every one of our RWAs and go on hikes with folks at the district and see things through the eyes of people who were really those wilderness managers. So your knowledge is really important. And then of course, these decisions are our commitments about how we move forward. And as the challenges with managing existing wilderness, the challenges of managing recommended wilderness are, are also a bit daunting um, because we need to follow through on what we said we would do and we need to try to um, protect the qualities that we said we'd protect um, and deliver. And then how do we talk about these places as we move forward? You know, now we're into that implementation phase and we're, we're you know, we have our rangers and we had a real strategy on getting out there in communities and talking to people and um, talking to, to groups and, and not taking away from the disagreements, but really encouraging people in the next step in a planning process is, is work together and roll up your sleeves and invest in stewardship in these places. So we're spending quite a bit of time um, and talking about that right now. And I think I'm gonna stop with that. It's uh, So that's my little vignette about a forest and working through this process. Again, I'm a, I'm a, I see huge value in wilderness and wild places and wild and scenic rivers, but how we land on those decisions when you think about that interface with communities and the existing conditions and desired conditions and management flexibility, it, it feels to me as if it's woven into all that other network of what's out there on the landscape and human uses and designations. That's great, Mary. Um, thank you so much. Um, all right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I think you have our contact information. If you've got questions for us, um, please feel free to email. Uh, we'll get you that information if you don't have it, though, but I think you do. Well, thanks, everyone. I think that's about it. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. It was a really interesting presentation and a great road trip.